ESO lecture series. This is the 13th lecture series organized by ESO together with uh, Polish University and COPLA. Uh, tonight's topic is about an inherent challenge that our cities, our towns, our villages, our territories are facing and we as a society as well as us as professionals need to find a solution in the near future. Spatial planning has always been subject to various social pressures and concerns and it's highly affected by economic, political, social but now more than ever environmental uh, issues. The ability of our system to adapt timely and to respond to these concerns is essential. Therefore, through the lecture series, through three very interesting presentations that we'll have today, we want to open this debate and discussion also in a, our little society in Albania. We have three keynote speakers, and I'll start with Professor Simin Davudi. To read her bio, I'll need a whole night, but I'll try to make it very short. She is Professor of Environmental Policy and Planning Director of Global Urban Research Unit at the Newcastle University. She is past president of, former president of the Association of European Schools of Planning, fellow of the Academy of Social Sciences, Royal Town Planning Institute, Royal Society of Arts. She has led the UK Office of Deputy Prime Minister's Planning Research Network and served on advisory panels for UK government departments dealing with planning, environment and climate change. She is co-editor of the Journal of Environmental Planning and Management. Her research on urban planning, environmental justice and governance Climate change and resilience has been funded through a range of national and international bodies and widely disseminated in over 200 publications and numerous invited talks. Her recent books include The Resilience Machine, Justice and Fairness in the City, Town and Country Planning in the UK, Reconsidering Localism, Climate Change and Sustainable Cities, and more and more and more and more books and uh, articles. So we are very lucky to have tonight one of the gurus, I would call, although she works at Guru of Climate Change and Planning. <laughs> and I will continue with the ladies. And tonight our last speaker is Dr. Rudina Toto. She is a senior expert in territorial and environmental planning and governance and head of the planning unit and of the workshop of territorial governance at COPLA, Institute for Habitat Development. She serves in academia since 15 years, initially at the Polytechnic University of Tirana and currently at Polish University and holds the Albanian Architecture Award of 2018. She has a strong urban and regional planning, as well as environmental management background, both by education and experience. She has conducted her studies initially at the Polytechnic University of Tirana, afterwards at Wageningen, Wageningen. sorry, there are no Dutch, so <laughs> I can <laughs> make a mistake with pronunciation. Wageningen University and Research Center, IHS Erasmus University in Rotterdam, as well as she has uh, finalized her PhD in the joint PhD program of Polish University in Albania and Ferrara University in Italy. She has also uh, been co-authored in various uh, articles, including a toolkit of territorial planning and development in Albania in 2015, the second edition, and 2012, the first edition. She is author of uh, several articles about planning and environment in Albania as well. She's also worked as a practitioner, giving 
technical expertise in urban planning, city development strategies, governance, regionalization, and regional development. So in short, she is our guru with regard to environmental planning. <laughs> I said for last, but not by importance, it's Professor Vestik Aliye, one of the founders and rector of Polis University. In fact, he was also one of the promoters for bringing the ASOP lecture series in uh, Tirana. He has a rich academic experience of more than 25 years. He has also been advisor of the Albanian Prime Minister during 2005-2007. Uh, he is one of the also co-founders and former executive directors of COPLAN, Institute for Habitat Development, which has been a pioneering professional institution in the field of territorial planning and development in Albania. He is founder of the architecture studio Metropolis, Metropolis and of the A plus P periodical journal that we have at Polis. At the moment, which is also one of the only scientific periodicals on architecture and urban planning in the Albanian speaking region. Professor Aliye has uh, completed his studies in architecture at the Polytechnic University of Tirana. In the verge of the socio-political and economic changes in the 1990s. Afterwards, he has completed his postgraduate studies in the Erasmus University in Rotterdam and his doctoral studies at the Polytechnic University of Tirana. His postgraduate education has also extended to studies in Norway, at Oslo University, Italy, University of Florence, USA, Harvard Business School, as well as in Peru, ILD. Lastly, we have another special guest with us tonight. It's Professor Paolo Pino from the University of Porto. He is the ISOP General Secretary and I would like to leave the floor to him now for a short Well, thank you very much. Um, it is really a pleasure to be here. Um, I, I will be brief, but I have to, to, to say a few words of introduction. And uh, first of all, I would like to thank our hosts, um, uh, in particular uh, the, Univers the Polish University of Tirana, and uh, as I was saying, in particular the director, Professor Besnik Aliyan, and uh, uh, also Ladio for all his work, also Dr. Rudina and all colleagues. And, um, uh, and to say that uh, it, it's really, I'm delighted to be here. Um, this is, as you know, it's a, an event associated with this association. Um, as I said, I, I like to be brief, but uh, uh, I'd like just to, to start by presenting uh, our association, the Association of European Schools of Planning. Um, <coughs> So, uh, this association was founded in 1987 and it's basically an international association of universities. Uh, the mission, as you can see, is essentially to promote uh, the development of planning education and planning research. Um, uh, apart from that, uh, we have an, a particular interest in the cooperation between the different universities that concentrate in this particular field and uh, all the exchanges that can be done um, uh, in particular in, the, in, the, in Europe. And uh, uh, we, we also uh, you know, really encourage the urbanization and the equivalence of degrees uh, related with planning. Um, well, as any association, we have a governance structure. 
Uh, actually, this picture is not uh, the, the right one. This, this was from last year, so the president changed now is Professor uh, Ben David. Um, but as you know, as any association, we have a, a general assembly, which is essentially a consulting body. Um, then we have the Council of Representatives, and I'm very pleased to, to, uh, to make the point that uh, Albania is represented in this Council of Representatives. And uh, we have the Executive Committee, which is a bit like a uh, government. So the Council of Representatives is the Parliament, and the Executive <coughs> Committee is, is the government uh, of the association. Um, we have uh, uh, um, uh, three or four, well, actually six types of membership. Uh, we have a full member, and the Polish University is a full member which means that we recognize uh, a full programming planning. That's one of the, the, the main criteria to, uh, to, be, uh, to become a full member of, uh, of the association. Then we have associate members, corresponding members, uh, uh, universities that are outside Europe, and uh, affiliate members, individual members, and obviously uh, our honorary members. Well, in the overall, this is quite a large association now, with more than 30 years, and we have 180 uh, institutional members. So this is quite a significant association. Uh, actually, it's perhaps the largest association in Bowl of this kind. Um, uh, uh, there is also a very large association in the United States, the so-called ACSP, uh, but I think we are slightly bigger, just slightly, but let's make it not, not, not a big deal. Anyway, um, uh, inside the association, uh, we have so-called thematic groups, that is, people that get together around a particular research topic and they develop their work, they develop their networking, and so, uh, as you can see from the range of subjects, uh, this is, I would say, one of the most interesting uh, aspects of our association because this means really to work together uh, on a particular topic with particular uh, uh, ends in mind. Um, we also have the so-called Young Academics Network. Uh, this is an organization within our organization and, uh, as the name suggests, is uh, directly targeted to uh, our younger members. Um, and, and they can be PhD students, they can be people just entering the, the academic career uh, in, the, in the early stages, I'd say. They are very active, so um, Everyone here, and I see many, many faces that look like uh, students, I guess. Uh, so if you, you pursue studies into a master or a PhD, this is a good place to be because, uh, you know, this is a way to get very easily contacts across Europe, you know, and, uh, and uh, it's in this, at this stage, that we really, uh, you know, uh, can build uh, the future uh, Public career. I have to say that myself, you know, um, I was involved uh, for the first time in a uh, ESO uh, initiative. It was a congress uh, in 1989 in Tour. At that time, I was just, you know, a young PhD. Uh, well, just finished uh, my PhD, and it was really very important for the the development of my own career, you know, to have these links across Europe. Uh, so, you know, I, 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 I grew up uh, as an academic and actually more or less at the same time as our association was, was growing. Uh, we have a, a program called uh, Quality Recognition and actually uh, your programming planning uh, got this certificate of quality which means that pass through a number of uh, important uh, uh, criteria of analysis 
Um, and uh, and uh, this is, I would say, a stamp of quality that the association provides to only, I would say, uh, a few courses that fulfill all the requirements of this evaluation process. So, well, Paul, this university, you know, is really, uh, you know, a, a very good example of, of exactly the application of this uh, quality re recognition program, which is relatively recent. You know, it has been developed over the last three or four years. Well, we have, as any association, we have uh, our external uh, relations. Um, we are part of so-called Global Planning Education Association Network. Uh, actually, one uh, at present, one of the members of, of our EXCO is the president of this of GPN, as we call it. And this GPN is made at the moment of 15 associations uh, similar to ESA, but covering other parts of the world. Um, from, from the United States to South America to Asia to Australia. So it's, it really covers you know, uh, almost all the world. So uh, this is the presence of ESOP in this uh, GPN is really important. Um, well, we have a number of partner organizations, that is, organizations that some of them are not related with planning education uh, and with planning research, but they, they, they provide you know, services, they have interest in, in planning, uh, sometimes from uh, a planning practice or from you know, an institutional perspective. But yeah, this is the range of, of different um, uh, institutions with which we have close contacts. Uh, well, we have a number of publications, um, uh, some journals. Uh, I, I'd like just to emphasize PlanX because it's an initiative of our Young Academics Network. And we, we have a recent uh, publication uh, called Transactions of ESOP. Um, and it's a regular uh, publication. And then we have some other publications like the, the uh, these of your book or the booklet series, which is also uh, an initiative of the young academics. So they are very active, actually, our young academics. Uh, uh, well, we have a number of awards, you know, uh, to promote excellence in planning education and also uh, in planning research. And. Uh, uh, we have, you know, uh, our uh, uh, annual events, and uh, I emphasize, of course, the annual congress, which is, the, I would say, the most important event. Uh, uh, next year, in July, uh, our annual congress will be in Venice, so I take the opportunity to invite you all to that uh, great city, and I'm sure it will be a great congress. Now, in, over the last two or three years, you know, our congresses have reached uh, the size of about 1,000 attendants, which is quite significant in you know, terms size. And we also have the Heads of School meeting, which is a smaller meeting of about 100, 150 uh, persons. The Heads of Schools, but some other people can also, you know, uh, uh, join this, this uh, heads of school meeting. Actually, uh, the last heads of school meeting it was exactly in Newcastle University, and our host was Professor Simon Davudi. Uh, so, um, so yeah, it's another initiative. Uh, the next uh, heads of school meeting will be well, not that far away from here in Ljubljana. Uh, so it uh, usually takes place uh, in March. Uh, late March, early April. And then we have the ESO PhD workshop. Uh, as you can imagine, is the PhD students. And it's an initiative that runs for about a week and it's usually uh, associated with the ESO Congress. It runs in the week before the ESO Congress. Uh, other initiatives we have we have the Conference of Young Academics. We have uh, the thematic group meetings and we have the lecture series. 
And the thing is, all these initiatives uh, are uh, you know, carried out on, base, on the basis of open calls. And uh, in the case of lecture series, uh, last year uh, <coughs> we opened the call and we got four applications. And from those four applications, I still remember them quite well, I have to say, three were excellent applications. But the best of them, of those three, was exactly the Polish University application. So you are really, you know, that's why we are here today and we are going to have the privilege of listening to uh, uh, my colleague and good friend, Professor Simon Davudi, among also uh, Professor Besnik and uh, Dr. Rubina. Uh, so that's it for now. Thanks very much. It was really pleasure. <laughs>
this piece and Albania became independent, were teams of with assistance of uh, Italian expertise came to Albania and tried to develop, to build a new nation, a new vision for this nation, a European face of the city centers, plans for 15 cities, and this was the, the type of plans that were provided, for example, this is the plan for Tirana and the transformation of the city center, which did not, by the way, destroy the inherited you know, neighborhoods of Tirana, but tried to develop a second Tirana, alternative Tirana for the future. But this was the time that the, the role of planners was played by engineers, health experts, um, designers, architects. This was the time that people perceived planning as a, a profession where the expert can draw a nice map, of course, with ideas behind and facts, and then through by doing the, the map, automatically the problem will be solved. So we, we solved uh, the problems by a nice design. That was the concept. At that time, we were not discussing about participation. We were not discussing about other things. But of course, expropriation, compensation, and all these things were working properly. Then a second layer for our heritage of planning is during communism. This is, uh, again, a plan from Iran. You see it's different even in the is the same concept uh, of axis or whatever uh, in terms of orientation of the people and the circulation in the city. But when it comes to the to the functions, we have a monofunctional city, monofunctional concept of planning. The city is divided in zones that have <coughs> one function and they are expressly covered. So here it's supposed only to sleep and live. Here it's supposed to play, to stay in the garden. Here it's supposed to be in the city center on the main axis. It's a very strict and uh, different uh, of what we face uh, today. This was the, the concept uh, implemented during the four to five decades of Muslim Albania. At the time, planning was led by architects. And partly some first planners in the history of Albania called urbanists. It was more Mediterranean school of, of planning, which is more focused on physical aspects and does not think about economy social dimension, politics, uh, financial, demography, or other uh, environment, and other issues. It's not that there was no concern, but that was. So at the time, uh, the planner, whatever background he has, he was more um, implementer of the orders coming from ideology, from, from power, from politics. And he has no right to think. He was, he was just supposed to be a good technician to develop a vision technically for, for, for the neighborhood, for the city, for, for the country, and he was supposed to implement it according to the financing and approval that politics did. So uh, that was more or less. But you see, the, there, is a, there is public space, but there are not people in the city because the city does not belong to the people. The end of this period, collapse of the system, things were not working at all, we ended up like the Northern Korea of Europe and uh, problems and were transferred from families to the street. People started to go and protest about the situation. There was almost a revolution. I was a student finishing my, my studies. I was there with like many other people. We were very hopeful, joyful that something finally solved Definitely can move, we move ahead, but in fact, we thought like one uh, third of the population, one in four uh, persons, and then left the country from this moment because of the difficulties on employment and institutions. Unfortunately, this process is due, I would say, half of the population after 1990, and this process unfortunately continues to grow through the years. It depends a lot on the political situation. I do not want to continue because this is a summary of the role of, of the background uh, uh, let's say indicators of, of many and the role of planners. I'm saying that through the presentation. <coughs> but if I look in the map, that was uh, Albania of uh, that was Albania in 91. Two thirds of all population was in fact living in the rural area. They were forced to be there. And 
one third in the main cities, especially, I would say, in the cities uh, like Yama, Bruce, and San, Lola, Shola, and Kosh. It was one of the most rural societies in, in Europe, together with Kosovo. Ten years after, through Insat, did the first survey. We uh, distinguished a movement, massive movement of population. The first, first one was emigrating abroad, as I explained. But the second one was concentrated in the western bank of the country, in the triangle, the shoulder, and the polygon area around the Arama, greater the Arama area, and Jora. Here, densification of population buildings is clearly high. And the process continues, but more peacefully now. And uh, in the second uh, census of the population of building shows that the process, as I uh, said before, it continues, but it's more consolidated in the metropolitan region, Iran, Rulos, and Basan, and probably two or three other cities. The rest of the country is done. Also, the western, uh, the eastern corridor from Kukus, Giver, Pograde, Scotia, that was a kind of alternative to the neighboring uh, Albanian speaking territories, is almost dying now. And there are not many people, or they go back seasonally when they're during the summertime when also there is more That is the uh, four years after transformation, that is ten years after transformation. Hogan played an important role in doing such monitoring together with international partners, we have many units from Harvard University that work with us and the Ministry of Public Works at the time. And uh, you see that the, the growth has been 5 to 7 percent per year. This is a big growth that you can compare with countries in India or Pakistan or but that we are a small country, so uh, in absolute value the numbers are not big, but for the how if you compare with our economy and resources, this is a big burden for, for our economy. Uh, the result. Densification of city centers. Verticalization of city centers. It was not uh, foreseen to develop the city on the nuclear basis of the city, on the units of the city. But it was developed in a very fragmentized way, parcel by parcel. And in this case, the city lost a lot of uh, public interest, a lot of public space. And it is now very difficult to, to recover. Despite the energy of people and the business that exists there and something that one. In addition, informality exploded, not only city center, but especially in the very, very informal center. And the amount of the so-called debt capital, now it's an informal, uh, in terms of, uh, if you evaluate the informal capital and formal business, it's equal to the formal economy. So we have a, a GDP in our country between 11 billion to 13 billion. The same amount is also in the private, in the informal sector. So if you consider both of them, it is double. So our economy is much more and much stronger, but we are not, we are not uh, able to extract the, let's say, benefit of such. Despite that, these are the extensions in periphery, despite the intensification of the city It was understood that formalization, we like it or not, is a alternative, and we can make war with 50% of the population. And especially in the situation where people have, have had no legal alternatives. So, uh, if we calculate, we did some research. We worked also with the anomalies of any disease. Eight years ago, and we calculated this amount that I mentioned of the debt capital. But uh, we discovered that this was three times more than foreign aid provided to Albania at the time. This was uh, nine times more than foreign investments in Albania. And this was uh, again nine times more than national research involved that we have. So it shows that money is there. <coughs> the economy is not poor. We are expecting foreigners to, to come and to invest. The money is here, but we don't know how to draw this money and how to put in legal channel and how to make citizens and business regular contributors to our formal economy. But what is the main crisis? And what we try to explain to the politicians also is the fact that the Albanian economy and society is based in four main fields in this home. Where we had organized crime eight years ago when we talked about these people were laughing and what is this? 
But now I don't need to explain this to the audience, what is organized crime, mafia, and drugs. We, are, we have a serious problem in this country about this. Uh, then is the informal economy. These are poor people in periphery, like Bacore or other informal settlements. They are not criminals. They might have problems with the law, but they are forced to be in this trap. Then is the uh, so-called people like us in this audience. But for some reasons, we fell in this condition that we call extra legality. We have legal properties, we have legal businesses, but something is registered not property, and we don't pay the, the total amount of the taxes that we should pay, or we don't contribute and don't benefit from the services as much as we want. And uh, one more is the last pillar is the formal economy, the part of society that really obeys of the legislation. So the question is how to bring these three pillars that are not criminals together. Formalizing the economy, bringing people, giving alternative, bringing them all together in order to create the absolute majority of 80%, 70%, 90%. And how to kick out these guys out of the game. This is, uh, for this moment, it's absolute priority of the country. And you know, more than me, that this is the main struggle. So if we want to be integrated uh, in the rest of Europe. But if you see the, the, you know, the GDP, this has changed up and down. And it shows that in the last period we are facing some, there is improvement, but we are facing some problems. And this growth is also because of the informal economy. So we should be realistic to really confront face-to-face -face the reality. Second, if you see the pyramid uh, of the demographic uh, pyramid of Romania, we have another problem, we have Professor Lodiva here, one of the best experts in the country. And she knows that what does it mean not to have such a pyramid. This is not a pyramid. This is a power. <laughs> we are missing. Nobody should be something that is missing. We are missing this part. This part is because we have now less people. And the the birth rates are going, you know, decreasing dramatically from four to five people in the past. A kids to one kid in average now. So this is something we need to confront with the national policy. It's not for joke. It's, not, it's very important for the future, future of the country. And from the other side, we have a huge number of immigration problems. Huge num number of immigration. Not only in the past, but now, young generation, people of 50s with their kids, emigrated because they don't see possibility of developments uh, in the country because of the political, lack of political consensus to move back. From the other side, we are in some of the most important corridors in the region. We are a gateway of the sort uh, the child that is here we've been discussing a lot. This is the main gate of east-west moving through Balkans, historic corridor. It is here in the Albanian coast, from Shkodra and Asia down to Dora. It is there, even on the around. But we are not exploring it directly. We did something to invest on in infrastructure, like the road of nations. We are trying, we, we did not benefit from uh, strategic investment of you because we are in the must be integrated. But uh, we had a luxury situation which we are not able to, to benefit because of this uh, situation, lack of consensus, we have said, and not speeding up the process of integration. In the of course, you has its own problems, not the perfect reality, we know, and okay, for them to struggle. In order to contribute as an institution, both for common policy, we've been working a lot in terms of research because we, can, we don't need to invent the, the wheel, but we need to contribute from our own perspective. Years ago, we started the process we call it, uh, and uh, drafted a document which was the Albanian 2030 Manifesto. In fact, this was the work that started in an academic process and to team for the group of people, the police and the trying to develop a methodology how to draft a national strategic plan, special plan, which is, was missing at the time, and trying to explain the, the strategic importance of strategic decision in how to govern resources and territory and population. Uh, so this publication is online, it is in English and Albania, and we provide the government. We are glad that one year later, government uh, built a document with more or less the same name, Albania 2030, uh, of course, they have more data. They have also international expertise on their side. They use also our reference. But they develop their own concept. It's a document. It's a, it's a change. It's a positive change, I would say. 
Although that is not, as I know, to my information, it's not approved, unfortunately, uh, approved officially, but it is a document that we are referring to further steps of planning in the country, and that is something very important. Also, in terms of uh, administrative uh, reorganization reform of the country, this government, this majority, in the first mandate, undertook important, uh, courageous, let's say, reform in terms of reorganize, reorganizing administ administratively and politically the matter of the country, <coughs> with the objective of consolidating first local governments, and in the second step, potentially reorganizing the resources of the country. The second one was frozen because of the lack of political consensus. The first one happened. We have out of 370 uh, municipalities, something, we have uh, now 61. It has good results, but it has also problems, new problems are, uh, raised, and we need to, to see them carefully. We need to see them technically, not just politically. We need to see them uh, on the fact basis. We need to, to see them from the impact in economy and society and maybe correct and improve. But I'm glad to say that Kokan and Polish at the same time together work and produce also a document that deals with the regions aspect that was blocked. This document, it is read by all politicians left and right and center. Nobody denied it. But it is not, as I said, approved because they, it needs constitutional change to go to the change of uh, map of the regions. So they prefer to, to keep it frozen rather than um, to, to open a discussion. This is harming the development of, of the country because if we talk about Europe and European integration, the Europe is, belongs to the region and the strategic investment goes exactly to kill the regional disbalance. We are not benefiting out, out, out of this and it's an absolute priority for us to go to such a discussion and should be part of national consensus to develop as soon as possible. Then, as regarding, uh, when we talk about planning and sustainability, we have different types. It's, it's very rich. It's a small country, but very rich in terms of typology and morphology of territory. Most of the country is hills and mountains, 70%. In the north, we have like, Alps, Pennsylvania, which is unique. Okay. In the western plain, it's uh, rich in terms of agriculture, but it's suffering a lot from the change, climate change. I think we have some conversations. You have uh, coastal areas which are highly densified and developed for tourist, touristic purposes. Some of them not in a sustainable way at all. But you have also virgin territories in the south and some other part of the country which are still there, not damaged, but there is big potential if we are not strategic to quickly plan them and uh, really implement developments which are sustainable. We have history, we have culture, some of them have UNESCO sites. They need special uh, kind of planning also. Not just planning, but planning that needs other specialized expertise. There are also several plans in, uh, done for these areas, but again, they are under threats of development. We have uh, city centers, we have capital cities, we have big cities, we have small towns, we have villages. They have different types of, of planning. They need different types of expertise. The area which is under protection it's around 60%. In some uh, types of protected area, we have increased the number of area under protection. In some others, we have decreased. But what is more important is the culture of maintaining them and protecting them and developing them for the, in a sustainable way for the best of the local economy. Still but we are now facing year to year something strange which was not there before. And this is due to the climate change, but this is also due to the wrong planning and uh, implementation of strategic investment we've done. From Tirana to Duras, in the winter, uh, you, you cannot, uh, you are not suffering only because of traffic, because the distance is very, very small. But you have to think very well, twice, before you go to Duras in winter and come back, because if it is winter and it's rain, suddenly you can be in the middle of water. And uh, for us, it's also, live and work in such an area, we know very well what does it mean. What is the threat in the last years because of flowers? As regarding the fires, fires were there as usually, but now are becoming a very uh, problematic issue. Last year we have 1,000 fire incidents in the country, which is like three or four times more than what we had in some years that we can see the record uh, in the past. 
And this is something that we, don't, we are not prepared for that. We are not prepared for with infrastructure. We are not prepared, prepared culturally how to deal with this. And this is a struggle for everyone who uh, rules this country, uh, left or right. So this is our national, let's say, priority that we should deal This issue of the CO2 emissions, it's, it's, it's the map. In fact, it's about it's, uh, it's, uh, five out of five. And there are also the uh, projection of temperature changes that move from one to three degrees in hundred years, in the coming hundred years. I don't know how exact they are, but they are from the uh, reports, national reports. But it shows that the, most of our CO2 emissions come, uh, first of all, uh, from energy sector, transport for energy and transport sector. It's like 45%. From then, use change and forestry, deforestation, 20%. Agriculture, almost 60%. Although the web industry and waste issues, they are not the main factor yet. So, the low polluters are in this moment high polluters. Can you imagine what will happen if we have a projection of development in other sectors? This is a map that shows uh, more or less what is the average temperature in different seasons. And what would be the projection of temperatures in 100 years? What would be precipitation of rain in, in the coming 100 years? And uh, some calculation of the last climate change report speaks about uh, uh, the difference between the season, the average, which goes 1 to 6. 1 to 6 is, is too much. And you can imagine what would be the consequence on the life, on the health of people, and uh, quality of life in general in this country. As a result, uh, from the report, but not only that, also from our studies, the Western plane of country, especially the coastal area, which is supposed to be our main drive force for our economy in the future, is under threat of flood. Temporary or forever, and uh, with the blue box here, or the dark brown color, you see the area that most probably will go under sea. And the rest is again will suffer because of the flooding or other factors uh, which are related. And, and that means all of the species that are uh, living in this the habitat that is still over the centuries here in this part of the we are going to lose it. And also the population that is concentrated because it is living there or because of tourism will be under threat. And the international priority I think for so uh, I don't want to go through, through them, but they are talking in, in the uh, adoption uh, plan and strategy for the for this coastal area to undertake certain measures. I'm, I don't think that we are still prepared and we are doing the right thing in this moment. And when I say this, we, I speak with my heart and I'm not talking about that or right, I'm talking for all governments in Ukraine. We are not, I don't know. If we are we're still working with the recommendations that were given in 2005 report, we have to see also what is the, the new report uh, to come out, which my colleague from environmental science is explaining that it will come maybe very soon. But uh, the national report on climate change. But what is the, the sad part is also the fact that uh, this report usually are driven from international experts or local experts working for international assistance, but. There is no uh, leadership uh, from the from the society and the Albanian institution. Again, I don't want to make it black and white because, as I said, there is also positive development. And positive de development is that we have a strategy now on territorial planning at the national scale. We have uh, reform on territorial reform uh, already, part implemented. We have awareness about environmental issues. We have programs built in public and private schools. Already we have a ministry for that. But the point is that we need to move fast. Because if we wait, then the cost will increase dramatically. OK, I would like to give it like this. And then Professor Sidney will continue. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. <coughs> we all have a lot of challenges that our country is facing. Now I'd like to leave the floor to Professor Simin Dabugi for his lecture.
everybody. Um, I'd like to start obviously by thanking Polish uh, University and especially Professor Alaya and also Isa and Copeland. I realize it's almost like part of the Polish University and Isa for providing the opportunity today for me to be here and to share some ideas with you. It's a great, great pleasure to be here and share the platform with some esteemed colleagues who are, have already spoken and ready to speak after I finish. But I also want to just sort of uh, express my special thanks to Remio uh, Alkia uh, because if, if it wasn't for his effort, we wouldn't have been here today. So many, many thanks to him. I think you've already had quite a bit about climate change and some of the issues around planning. And I'm going to sort of add to that and sort of the apocalyptic picture of climate change. I'm going to say, remind everybody here, I think probably probably the same ground that Professor Redmond just covered, is that last month we received, we received another stark warning from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And their latest report is telling us that we've got only 12 years to keep the rise in the global mean temperature to one and a half centigrade degree, relative obviously to pre-industrial level. And that every fraction of additional warming would worsen the impact. And we've got a little video, it's only two and a half minutes, just to give us a glimpse of what all these things mean. So could you just have a quick look at that? I thought you might just sort of get us going, um, just listening to a different voice for two and a half minutes. Only set to get worse. Rising sea levels, extinction of species, homes and habitats destroyed by flooding, loss of land, famine and drought. The planet is around one degree Celsius warmer than it was 160 years ago. Now that might not sound like a lot, but actually that warming is having a big effect on the world around us. And scientists are saying that if we can keep global temperatures from rising by no more than half a degree more by the end of the century, then it's going to be better for us, for the planet, and everything on it. So why is that exactly? Ice sheets and glaciers are already melting. Sea levels are rising, and that means flooding. Low-lying areas such as islands in the Pacific are at risk of disappearing entirely, and many cities like these could disappear beneath seawater. Here's the thing, though. Current research shows that we're due to sail past this 1.5 degree mark, this crucial time, within the next 12 years. By the end of the century, the planet will have warmed by more than twice that amount. If we take steps to reduce global warming to one and a half degrees, these things will still happen, yes, but the situation won't be nearly so bad. Sea levels will still rise, but not as much as if the world was hotter. Millions more people will avoid having their homes flooded. The number of people who'd experience a lack of water would be halved. Half the world's animals and plant species would be able to keep large parts of their habitats that they would otherwise lose. Scientists say that if we are going to stop the situation from getting any worse, if we are going to preserve the world as best we can and keep to this limit of 1.5 degrees, the world needs to stop doing so much of this, and it needs to do a lot more of this. Half our energy by 2050 will need to come from renewable sources. Even then, we'll have to plant millions of trees to soak up carbon dioxide and use machines like these to... Actually that the spatial planning has a critical role in transition from fossil fuel economies by doing things such as considering you know, how land should be used to reduce urban sprawl, what kind of buildings should be designed to increase energy efficiency, and how renewable energy can be incorporated into new development. These are all about what we use, what we call climate mitigation. But my talk is not about climate mitigation, and it's probably more relevant to adaptation, climate adaptation. Because even if 
the best mitigation measures are in place to keep the global warming even to one and a half degree, which is already quite ambitious, we are still faced with the consequences of the past emissions. We will really still experience sea level rise, extreme weather events, water shortages, frequent flooding, heat waves, and wildfires. But what we don't know is the exact nature, severity, and implications of these events. And that is because of the complex feedbacks and radical uncertainties that are inherent in climate systems. The social certainties are not exclusive to climate change. They are prevalent in most aspects of our lives. When we look at the events such as the banking crisis, terrorist attacks, social upheavals, and even our own everyday life experiences, we realize how little we know about what is going to happen next. Governing and managing such a state of flux is highly challenging for urban governance in general and planets in particular, because their job is to think about long-term futures. In response to this challenge, one concept that has attracted everybody's attention more than any other is resilience. The idea is that in order to deal with these sudden shocks, we need to be resilient. And the attraction of this idea has been such that a growing number of think tanks, philanthropic organizations, governmental and non-governmental institutions, and even corporate entities have made resilience their top priority. And you can see some examples, international examples on this slide. They've developed a multitude of toolkits, guidelines, and indicators about how to make cities, citizens, and ecosystems more resilient. One of the most high-profile <coughs> initiatives, which is of relevance to planning, is the Rockefeller Foundation's 100 Resilient Cities program. So it is not surprising that resilience is now seen as the buzzword of our time. And it's almost replacing sustainability in our policy discourses. But although its popularity is recent, its origin is not. Resilience has a long and meandering, if you like, genealogy, with multiple groups in science, in engineering, in disaster studies, in psychology, in mechanics, and even anatomy. But neither this long history nor its widespread appeal has led to a common understanding of what resilience actually means and how it's interpreted in policies and practices. So to set some, some lights on these questions and to map out how they can be linked to planning, I will talk about two fundamentally different meanings of resilience and discuss how they align with two different understandings of space and place and two different approaches to spatial planning. I'll start with the engineering interpretation of resilience and show how its assumptions are similar to the absolute and bounded understanding of a space and the blueprint approaches to planning. I will then talk about the evolutionary interpretation of resilience and show how it's aligned with the relational understanding of space and the adaptive approaches to planning. Physical scientists and engineers were amongst the first groups to use the term resilience to denote the ability of a system to return to equilibrium after a disturbance. For them, 
the resistance to a stress or disturbance and the speed by which the system returns to an equilibrium state are the measures of the system resilience. The faster the speed the system bounces back, the more resilient it is. Applying this idea to the social and spatial context implies that the resilient city is a city which recovers back to where it was after a crisis, such as a climate disaster, a terrorist attack, or a political upheaval. Engineering resilience has influenced the debates in a wide range of disciplines. For example, economic geographers often draw on this concept to explain the trajectory of digital economic change as a process of punctuated equilibrium. In disaster studies, urban resilience is often defined as the capacity of a city to rebound from destruction, and often putting the emphasis on quantitative measures of recovery. In psychology, where resilience thinking has a very long history, the resilience to trauma is defined as the ability of people who are exposed to destructive events to maintain relatively stable level of psychological and physical function. And in public policy, it's just one example there from the UK, and our even everyday discourses, many of the references that we make to resilience also implicitly or explicitly based on this engineering perspective, which puts the emphasis on bouncing back to a previous state, which is considered as normal, but without questioning the desirability of normal or seeking a new normal. So, so for some of the survivors of Hurricane Katrina, returning to normal meant bouncing back to poverty. <coughs> this equilibrium-based resilience can be traced back to the enlightenment back to the 18th century. When the scientific revolution stripped the universe from its divinity and symbolic values and conceived it as an orderly mechanical device, a giant clock in a state of equilibrium, which can be governed by a set of mathematical rules. It was believed that the laws of nature could be unraveled through scientific discovery and the behavior of the clockwork universe could be predicted and controlled. Of course, uncertainty was acknowledged, but it was believed that the only limit to knowing the laws of nature was scientific or epistemic limit. That we could predict future outcomes by simply having better science. Knowledge was seen as capable of knowing what is to be known. And our continuing fascination with predict and control has its root in this way of thinking about urban futures or futures in general. And our aspiration to create, maintain, or return to elusively static equilibrium. In planning, and you've already seen some examples from Bethnic, the quest for a spatial equilibrium and the command and control mentality again has a long history. And it was at the heart of the modernist planning in many Western countries. A classic and highly influential example is the Charter of Athens the brainchild of a group of avant-garde architects, planners, and urbanists who set up the International Congress of Modern Architecture back in 1930s. For this modernist manifesto, a good city was a city in a state of equilibrium among all its respective functions. The charter describes cities of the early 20th century as being in a state of chaos, because of the uncontrolled and, and disorderly development, leading to increasing congestion, overcrowding, 
disorderly use of land, chaotic functional relations, and spreading blight. I suppose we all agree that their diagnosis of urban pro problems was pretty accurate. In fact, it can equally apply to many contemporary cities across the world. But their solutions for tackling these problems were limited and misguided. Because their functionalist reading of the city and their physically deterministic approaches to planning were based on a conviction that by simply designing better cities, they could build better societies. <coughs> Le Corbusier, the renowned author of the charter, claimed that the city is dying because it's not constructed geometrically. Doxiadis' ambitious acoustics theory was to develop a science of human settlement based on a series of orderly classifications of size, location, and function. His ideal Dinopolis, as he called it, which was supposed to be a dynamic city, was in fact rigidly predetermined to be unidirectional and built on the basis of a rectangular grid network of roads. In many ways, their social engineering prescriptions suffered from the same Newtonian misconceptions that underpinned the engineering resilience. Because they conceptualized the space as an absolute neutral container, a bounded entity that is independent of people, of objects, and of events. This is static view of spatial relations led to the top-down and inflexible blueprint plans of the post-war era. <coughs> the plan-making process itself was expert-driven, as you mentioned earlier, Pesney, and plans were presented to the public as fait accompli. Planners believed that a functional equilibrium and a steady state in a city could be achieved by the commanding power of the plan. Le Corbusier famously wrote in capital <coughs> letters that the plan must rule. In the 1960s, the rise of system theory and cybernetics, powered by computer modeling, gave planners even more confidence about their ability to predict to predict the behavior of urban systems by unpicking the behavior of their components' parts. And that in turn would enable them to control the future trajectory of the city through technical rational planning procedures. These ideas have had a profound influence on architecture and planning practices of post-war Europe and indeed elsewhere. They have left their marks on numerous cities and towns around the world. In the UK, they led to what Peter Hall, very eminent late Peter Hall planner, what he called the great planning disasters of the 70s. The technical rational approach is still dominant planning practices in many parts of the world, despite being challenged significantly by new developments in spatial theories as well as resilience thinking. And I'm going to spend the second part of my talk to tell you about these new developments. Starting with new other ideas about resilience. Evolutionary resilience is a different way of thinking about resilience. It puts the emphasis not on bouncing back to normality, but on ability of the systems to change, to adapt, 
and crucially to transform in response to sudden shocks. It's about creating untried beginning and it's about breaking away from undesirable normal. It's not a fixed asset or a trait that some people have and others don't, but a continually changing process. It's not a being, but a becoming. It may emerge when systems are confronted with shocks. In the social context, this means that people may become resilient, not in spite of adversities, but because of it, as Hemingway has put it so eloquently. Evolutionary resilience recognizes the seemingly stable state that we see around us in nature or in society can suddenly change and become something radically new with characteristics that are profoundly different from those of the original. That faced with adversities, we hardly ever return to where we were. Well, this in, in itself is not such a groundbreaking idea. What is new is the acknowledgement that these unpredictable shifts in a system can happen with or without external shocks and with or without proportional or linear cause and effect. So the idea of cause and effect really going out of the window. It sets the resilience of the system in the context of the evolution of the system itself. And this kind of understanding of resilience is rooted in complexity theory, which has challenged the old Newtonian view of the world and its mechanistic assertions of equilibrium. It considers the universe as complex, not complicated, complex, and inherently unpredictable. It defines open systems as non-linear, self-organizing, and permeated by uncertainty and discontinuity. Its take on uncertainty is radically different from engineering resilience. Because according to complexity theory, we don't know the unknown, not just because of our limited science or knowledge, but also because of the logical impossibility of knowing the unknown. So it's an ontological thing rather than a systemic thing. In other words, it is because we are dealing with unknown unknowns a phrase that you all know was popularized by Donald Bronson, the U.S. Secretary of Defense. So complex cities, sorry, complex systems such as cities can be approached heuristically as a non-linear iteration, like an infinite cycle, of an adaptive cycle, which has four distinct phases. Exploitation and growth, conservation, collapse or creative destruction, a word used by Schumpeter, and reorganization. The idea is that the first loop of the cycle relates to emergence, development, and stabilization of a particular path. And then the second loop relates to its rigidification and decline. So as soon as it becomes rigid, it declines, while at the same time, and that's the important point, at the same time of the collapse, it signals the opening up of unpredictable possibilities or spontaneous reorganization, which may lead to a new growth path. So the idea is that as systems mature, their resilience will be used and they become an accident waiting to happen. And when systems collapse, a window of opportunity opens up for alternative <coughs> pathways. 
So this disruptive phase, which sounds very scary, can in fact be a time, is in fact the greatest uncertainty, the time of greatest uncertainty, but very high resilience. Because it is the time of innovation and transformation. It's when a crisis can be turned into an opportunity. Climate change is a good example of such a crisis that could lead to positive changes if we, if we do take the opportunity. And not only positive changes in terms of transition from a carbon economies, but also transformation to more progressive societies. And then later on, responding to some of the paradoxes in that infinite adaptive cycle that I showed you, uh, somebody called Buzz Holling, a Canadian theoretical ecologist who made the word resilience as popular as it is today, and his team developed something else, even more sophisticated, and they called it the panarchy. And they suggested that systems function not just in one cycle, but in a series of nested adaptive cycles. And these different nested cycles interact at multiple scales, from small to large, multiple speeds, from slow to fast, and multiple time frames, from short to long. So you can have stability at one scale and change at another. And that's how you can resolve the paradox. In this nested adaptive cycle, the small changes can amplify and cascade into a big regime shift, while large intervention may have little or no effect at a different scale. So past behavior of a system is no longer a reliable predictor of its future behavior, even when circumstances are the same. So what do all these mean for planning? Does complexity mean the end of planning? If nothing is certain except uncertainty itself, would planning be condemned to solve yesterday's problem? Well, the short answer to those questions is no. On the contrary, preparedness is at the heart of evolutionary resilience. And it's not limited to being prepared for short-term emergency responses and immediate recovery that we see all the time, but it's also about being prepared for building long-term <coughs> capacities. So it's the long-term capacity building which is the real meaning of preparedness. And it means developing a qualitative capacity that can absorb and accommodate future events in whatever unexpected form they may take. It's a big ask. So we so it's not about trying to predict what is happening and then prepare for it. It's trying to be prepared for whatever happens. And such preparedness calls for a different type of plan, which in turn requires a different understanding of space and place. So instead of thinking, about a space as a bounded physical container, we need to think about it as relational, as fluid, as contingent. We need to think about it as being socially and culturally produced through our interactions, through the interactions of people, objects, and events. David Harvey, a very famous geographer, many years ago, said that our social interactions do not operate in a space, but actively construct a space. Planners, traditional focus 
focus on physical geography of proximity, the map that Kesnik was showing up, zoning this and zoning, whatever has happened next to it, should really be complemented at least with the relational geography of connectivity. So it's not about two things near each other, it's about the connection of the things that are far away from each other. And connectivity is the key feature of our globalized world of material and virtual flows of people, goods, ideas, and indeed environmental resources and pollutions. So as planners, we need to remind ourselves that people do not live in a framework of geometric relationship. You know, the stuff that, you know, in cities dying because it's not geometric. But they actually live in a world of meanings. They attach values to places they live and work in. And by doing that, they shape those places through their social encounters, cultural exchanges, personal memories, and everyday life experiences. So the relational understanding of the space highlights the contingency of our socio-spatial relations. And as such, it resonates with the evolutionary resilience, which considers cities as being in a constant process of becoming. To plan under the condition of fluidity and contingency, we need to move away from technical, rational, and blueprint <coughs> planning. We need to embrace what we may call adaptive planning. You may call it differently, but adaptive planning seems to me is a good way of describing this new way of thinking. In fact, one of the first discussions about adaptive planning emerged in the 1900s when John Dewey, a key advocate of American pragmatism, a philosopher, <coughs> suggested that policies should be treated as experiments with the aim of promoting continual learning and adaptation in response to experience over time. Today, the concept of adaptive planning owes its resurgence and popularity, maybe, to evolutionary resilience and its application for tackling the uncertainties of adaptation to climate change. Adaptive spatial planning is driven not by the will to order space and time, by imposing things like nested hierarchies or geometric grids, but by the will to connect, to connect multiple overlapping relations between materials, people, resources, and ideas. And this requires combining I'm going to use Bruno Latour's phrases here, combining matters of facts with matters of concern. It requires paying attention to the objectives and physical matters of space, as well as the subjective and social concerns about the places, which planners are never good at that, haven't been very good at that. Henri Lefebvre, Again, a very uh, famous um, geographer argued all those years ago that it is the dialectical relationship between the conceived spaces of planets, the stuff that we see on maps and documents, the perceived spaces of our imagination about the places, and the lived spaces of everyday life, which make up the places that we get in. So adaptive planning is not about predicting and controlling these relational complexities or eradicating uncertainty. It's about working with them, making adjustments along the way, and identifying 
And here comes again back evolutionary resilience thinking. Identifying transformative opportunities which may arise from these uncertainties and complexities. So adaptive planning focuses on exploring the unknown in search of novel practices, rather than being paralyzed by uncertainty and retreat to a status quo or formulate policies that we see in our plans. It is the rejection of fixity and rigidity of blueprint plans and their rationalistic assumptions. It's about recognizing the ubiquity of change and seizing the potential for disruptive innovation. Such a radically different approach to planning can only become possible if a number of preconditions are in place, such as agile institutional frameworks, which can enable creativity and self-organization in dynamic environments, highly networked and reflexive planners capable of spontaneous and imaginative responses to fast-changing circumstances. And of course, inclusive processes that listen to diverse voices and values and draw on multiple forms of knowledge, not just the expert, systematic, experimental knowledge, but the local, passive, experiential knowing of people as well. So as I mentioned earlier, complexity theory tells us that the small changes can amplify and lead to major shifts. Using this principle, the notion of urban experimentation has gained a lot of currency amongst planners and other urban actors. The idea is to purposefully intervene in urban areas through small, yet disruptive experiments. This is a very small example, which is the temporary greening of high street in Newcastle. The aim is to innovate and to learn and to gain experience about how a small intervention, and so many other things, but quite often we don't know what to do with it, which is correct. The data is, of course, useful. It makes some of the relation of those that I was talking more visible. But some of these urban labs suffer from the same problems which led to the criticism of the technical rational planning traditions. Like them, some of these urban labs are primarily preoccupied with collecting matters of fact through quantitative measurements, and much less interested in matters of concern. They, too, are based on expert-driven, predict and control mentality that focuses on the physical attributes of the city and abstracts its social context and social relation. It doesn't pay that much attention to the sense of place and to the multiple and diverse ways in which people experience and engage with places. Like their less sophisticated predecessor, their scientific data-driven view of the city leads them to believe that better data creates better places. So I'm going to recap now. You'll be pleased to know I'm finishing. Climate change has been a wake-up call in many ways. Crucially, it has revealed the fallacy of the modernist assumptions about our ability to conquer and exploit nature with little or no consequences. I mean, we know this is not the case. 
But it's also shown that predictions, this is a bit of an irony here, predictions are very difficult, especially about the future. Even the oracle of Delphi couldn't get it right all the time. And she had the crystal ball. It's even more problematic to assume that the future will be a continuation of the past. Because it's like driving a car by looking through the rear view mirror. We've come a long way in advancing our modeling techniques, our forecasting and projections and so on, in order to master uncertainty. And these have been immensely helpful for dealing with probabilistic futures. But not so helpful for dealing with the unknown unknown. And this challenge, plus the entrenched technical rational mindset of blueprint planning, led John Friedman, one of the great planning theorists of our time, to once suggest that the conventional concept of planning is so deeply linked to the Euclidean, Euclid three-dimensional geometry, Euclidean mode, that it is tempting to argue that if the traditional model has to go, then the very idea of planning must be abandoned. I always find myself in agreement with the great John Friedman. But on this occasion, I beg to get him. Because if there is one takeaway message from my talk today, it is to suggest otherwise. It is true that complexity and uncertainty are the defining features of our time. We can't ignore that, and we can't do much about it. But this doesn't mean that we should abandon planning. It simply means that we need a different kind of planning, one that takes fluidity and complexity of social, spatial, and ecological relations seriously and one that more than anything else mobilizes the power of creativity and imagination and does not underestimate our ability to imagine how we might be otherwise. Thank you. Research that I'm conducting with my colleagues 
uh, the findings I'll bring today are still preliminary findings, but still I think are quite interesting to discuss, worth discussing, I mean, and worth hearing about. Um, okay. So it was already said that Albania is a country which is really at high risk of uh, climate change effects. And um, after Paris Declaration, we, I mean, our government actually committed that it will reduce CO2 emissions by almost 12% by 2030. And this is exactly, I mean, I would say, a very uh, challenging and ambitious target that the government has undertaken. And in order to achieve the target, of course, it requires, in one side, I mean, um, expensive technical measures, but on the other side, also soft measures. And actually, the third national communication report and all documents that are being produced by the government in Albania somehow <coughs> raise the uh, necessity for addressing climate issues through soft measures as well, planning um, The territory, I mean, Albania is very diverse in terms of its territory, and so are the risks that it will be your from climate change events. Uh, this is already mentioned that 60% uh, of, of the territory is protected area, though there is an intention of the government to bring this up to 30. And uh, so far, municipalities are responsible for 83% of the forest after the uh, government reform we had in 2016, which actually shows that most, I mean, a big portion of the load is on the local level. And not only because of forest, but also because if 45 in 2005 and 49% in 2009 of CO2 emissions come from the energy and transportation sector and energy there, it means housing. So it's not energy production, it's use of energy actually. I mean, these are uh, activities or events or issues which happen at the local level, which means most of the burden is at the local level. And it means that local governments have to be prepared in a way or another to deal with climate change events. And they, in order to do so well, they need planning. So they cannot just start taking action without thinking what works in their context and how much is it going to cost and how to prioritize. Um, in Albania, we have a planning system now, um, which, um, I mean, is a kind of hierarchy of plans. Right now, we have 44 plans which are approved at local level, and another 16 are being in process. There is only one for the municipality being left today. And there are also three plans at national scale, one about the national territory, the other one, and the other two are regional plans, as you can see. I mean, the map there is actually showing the municipalities that we selected for this study versus the uh, planning initiatives being undertaken. Our 12 municipalities are those with a small red dot, but I will, I will talk about the selection of the way of making it in a while, actually. Before, I would simply like to emphasize uh, or to reiterate, let's say, uh, what the national plans are saying about uh, climate change related issues. Um, the National Territorial Plan, which is a comprehensive plan, of course, it's um, addressing climate change issues at a vision and principles level, but also at objectives level and uh, projects level. And for the national level, it's defining that we need to improve legislation and capacities on one side, while at the sectorial level, we need to work especially to uh, uh, prevent coastal erosion or improve uh, uh, territories if erosion has happened then uh, work with forestation and diversify our energy system. At local level, I mean, all these three uh, objectives are taken again, but then uh, the, the national plan has also the drainage and irrigation system. And this is again very important for the local level because um, all the secondary and tertiary networks of irrigation and uh, drainage systems in Albania are now managed uh, by local level, by the municipalities. And this is uh, an infrastructure which we have inherited from before 1990s. It was quite well in place during that time, but not well maintained after the 90s. And uh, I mean, in the circumstances that this infrastructure is all constructed along the plain, the coastal plain, I mean, which is in the west of Albania, or agricultural plain, actually. Uh, maintaining it and improving it with climate change in mind is really very, uh, very, very important, especially in view of floods that we're going to experience. We're experiencing floods every year, actually, now, the last five years, you know, twice a year, and it's going to be worse 
uh, if those scenarios are going to happen and definitely the 1.5 scenario is going to happen here in a way or the other. The coastal plan, it has more of an um, environment character. So uh, there are, let's say, measures such as increasing size of protected areas up to 30 percent, beach restoration, biodiversity corridors along the rivers, or again addressing erosion, deforestation, etc. While in the case of the Tirana Durus plan, this is a plan which has mainly an economic character. So of course, all three are comprehensive plans, but they have a focus each of them. Therefore, most of the measures which are proposed are mostly measures that happen at the level of the, at, at the urban area. So it's about urban infrastructure or urban green areas or public transportation and, uh, and, and again, in fact, irrigation systems which comes from the uh, national plan. But now let me go to, um, to the research and to the findings. Before talking about the findings, just a bit on the methodology, we use content analysis, meaning we are studying planning documents for 12 municipalities. And we did that by purpose. We did not want to understand positions or perceptions. We did not do interviews or ask people. That was not the intention. I mean, to understand how the process of planning went and what people were discussing about climate change. We want to see what the documents had, because at the end of the day, people at the municipality, whether they worked or not on those documents, they have to implement them and also improve them, because the documents are dynamic, of course. And if there is nothing in those documents, it means that they have to start thinking differently. Or if there is something, it means that they have to either improve it or see how to implement it. We made 33 questions for ourselves, of course. <laughs> Uh, based on the third national climate change report, but also on two toolkits, which actually show more or less how uh, adaptive, adaptive planning at local level could be uh, actually organized, how it could take place somehow from a practical point of view. Uh, we selected 12 municipalities, which you can see here, and we use a number of criteria, four criteria. One is location, the other one is risks, environmental risks actually, and population and area. And the whole idea is that for each criteria, we have a diversity of municipalities. So if we say here topography and hydrology, then we should have municipalities which represent all kinds of topography typologies in Albania. Of course, for water, Albania uh, water resources is really rich, but all of our water resources and the rivers are seasonal. So somehow we are really going to experience failures, especially in our energy system if we were going towards those climate change scenarios. Uh, this is agriculture land showing, I mean, how the municipalities are vis-a-vis uh, -vis the agriculture land distribution. So we have plain and, uh, I mean, agriculture land and forest. And here you can see the environmental protected areas, but also the hydropower plants. Now, in a video, I don't know how many hundreds of hydropower plants we have built and planned. Uh, sorry, how many? <laughs> 500, okay, that's horrible. <laughs> we have the big ones with cascades and lakes, and we also have small ones being built. I mean, the small ones are like um, one megabyte installed capacity of power. Um, these are built in the, the small river streams. They are taking the water from the local communities, destroying the biodiversity there. And we are claiming that we have clean energy, but actually for the very near future, which is climate change related, that is really very unsustainable and it's not in favor of the resilience. I mean, you can see here more or less from the River Watch the distribution also of the hydropower dams. In terms of population, the blue ones are the municipalities selected, so they represent all kind of uh, uh, municipalities. Tirana is not here because Tirana has uh, more than 500,000 inhabitants and it would really distort the graphic, and that's why it, it's not here. Well, Tropoya has the lowest uh, population for our select, which is like less than 20,000 inhabitants, just to understand the scale. And it's the same about size. The, the, the black ones are the selected municipalities. In terms of risks, Albania is diverse, the risks are diverse. All of our municipalities, the selected ones, but also the others, will experience all of the technologies and risks. Floods will not be the same everywhere, but still there will be floods and droughts. And there is one thing I would like to mention about Albania. I like to call Albania and other uh, southern parts of Mediterranean countries as a, a protective barrier to the continental 
to the inland countries. So if something wrong happens uh, uh, to these countries which are in the south, then right away um, Albania will not only have a, a, a national problem, but it will be a regional problem because climate will be shift in the continental one. So I assume that those countries who now have a continental climate will most probably will not have that anymore once the Mediterranean will experience uh, problems. Um, this is a map of fires. I mean, basically, I'm not sure mentioned that. Just to show the distribution, more you go to the north and to the east, where more the continental climate is felt, the less fires there are, and more to the south, the more fires there are. And, and then this is about soil seeding, uh, which is an approximation based on chlorine, artificial layers, um, which tells us a lot about the filtration capacity for soil. And finally, floods, with the scenario of 1.5 and the scenario above 1.5. It really, I mean, it matters a lot which scenario it is, but even in the first scenario, I mean, we are going to lose agriculture land, we are going to uh, lose wetlands, and we are going to lose settlements. Duras and Leja are going to be affected at city level, while other settlements at, in the agriculture area, uh, it's like around 100,000 inhabitants which are calculated to be affected by this scenario in the cost, always. And I'm not talking about the other risks, I'm only talking about floods in the cost. So, now going to the findings. The very first thing we did is, of course, to see, I mean, is the term climate change used at all in the planning documents or not? So is there any kind of sensitivity? And luckily we found that, yes, there is some sensitivity, and some uh, times it's really good sensitivity, like in the strategic environmental assessment, in the text, in all of the municipalities, the term is used and is also discussed. So it's not just mentioning the term. And the less it is mentioned in regulation, in the plan regulation. Of course, this is a kind of law. It has to cover many other uh, aspects of the plan as well. So it's not only climate change, and then that's why it appears less. And the same could be said about maps. If we look at dedicated sections, I could say that none of the municipalities has a dedicated chapter on climate change, but all of them have dedicated sections. So uh, it's not given maybe the importance we would like it to be given, but still it is there. Uh, in terms of documents per municipality and documents of dedicated sections per municipality, we can see that in most of the cases it's like about... Uh, is that not I think this is more or yes. And uh, these are just some examples of how different municipalities deal with uh, the topic. Like here, for instance, this is a map of environmental vision. But some of the aspects are dealt with indirectly with climate change. And this is another map which is dedicated to climate change. So this is a vision with measures of what could be done in case of climate change events. It, uh, it includes like issues like, for instance, uh, restoring riparian areas in the rivers, or even um, defining areas for relocation of people in case of uh, emergence, uh, emergent events. And then there are other municipalities, like Škodra, for instance. Maybe they did not have a dedicated map, but they had a dedicated program, because Škodra in the north is one of those cities which is going to be highly affected because it's like in a bottleneck location. I mean, of three rivers and one lake joining together, uh, <coughs> agriculture land, yes, and then floods every year. So the plan has built for actually a sub program and then projects on how to deal with which of the uh, sorry each of the areas in terms of uh, building resilience, resilience actually. Then we looked at other terms. Interesting enough. Uh, I would like to point this out. I mean, we have like 80% of the municipalities use the term resilience, but it's strange because they use, don't use the term uncertainty. And actually, when we talk about resilience, it means you have to understand uncertainty first, and that's why then you think of resilience. So uh, that makes me think that it could be either because of I don't know the technical capacity of the person who are working, but I don't think this, this is the one. Rather, I think that our municipalities, and this could be seen also from the other terms, which are almost zero there, but also the professionals, 
they think climate change is important. They think uh, it's a big requirement we have to deal with. But none of us really <coughs> trust that in 12 years we have a fresh hold. We have like a limit uh, which will tell us which scenario are we going towards. So none of us trust that in our lifetime we are going to have the problems or the risks of climate change effects that everybody is talking about. I mean, in one side, this could be positive thinking. If we were thinking of catastrophes all the time, then we, it would be a very depressive society. But on the other hand, uh, institutions have to be forthcoming. I mean, they have to think ahead, and, and also people, not only institutions. Um, the plans do not include a climate change vulnerability analysis, but out of 12, try to link their demographic and socioeconomic analysis with climate change scenarios. And 10 out of 12 also try to link economic development analysis with climate change. Um, this is another graph which is actually showing where climate change in the GLTP sections, now not in the documents but in the sections, is addressed directly or indirectly. And we see that in the vision, it's always indirectly. Maybe because the vision is too abstract, or maybe because we don't trust it. But then when we move from strategic objectives to projects, then it becomes more direct and less indirect. Uh, the indicators, and these are the plan indicators, the, the indicators for the implementation of the plan. Uh, indirectly, they might somehow, but I don't think even indirectly, they address climate change. So the indicator is mostly whether the project is done or not, but it does not have uh, like a thinking on, on the environment or climate change related issues. And then for the sale objective, you it might sound strange why the direct is lower than indirect, but it's because the strategic environmental assessment has like um, five to eight objectives in this, each case, and one or two of them are always directly related to climate change, and then the others are both. Uh, all of them related to climate change, but in an indirect way. This is an example from Tropoia. Uh, it's an example of an objective, but also a project, a forest fiction project. Uh, and then it's Crunch, another example, like the previous ones I showed to you. And then we have Tirana, another example. This is an example of two projects. Both are actually urban projects. Tirana um, has mostly, I think, urban projects related to climate change. Uh, the second one, for instance, is about uh, promoting a bike network in the city aiming at reducing emissions. So it's sustainable mobility, but aiming at reducing CO2 emissions. I mean, we said transportation is one of the uh, highest contributors in CO2. Information-wise, I mean, that's a big problem in Albania because we don't have information. And we are talking about that in certain context. So all of the information used in the plans is based on third parties reports. We were afraid that maybe some municipalities could be also speculating, but luckily none of them did. But still the graph shows that the situation is not as good as it should be because it's really other uh, reports. Uh, which means we have to produce data and we have to do that in real time in order to be able to predict, if I could say so, <laughs> predict the future. Um, this is an example of how, for instance, municipality of Trapoi made use of third parties report uh, to produce maps for its own territory. And here we go to measures. So we see that all of the municipalities, um, in, I mean, include adaptation measures, and then the other measures are like in balance somehow among them. But what strikes me here is emergency. Um, I mean, Albania is really we deal with climate change related issues in an emergency uh, mode. And that is really uh, shown, in, as I said, in the last five years we had these troubles with plants and uh, instead of planning ahead in order to either prevent or be able to mitigate in such a way that people were not affected. In fact, every year people were affected and, and um, farm animals were affected and, and land was affected. Um, here we look at the instruments. Um, in the case of the instruments, okay, well, all of the municipalities have uh, technical instruments because this is the easy, easiest type of the instrument to be foreseen in a plan, like forestation or, or, or restoring riparian areas and so on. But when it comes to, for instance, financial instruments, 
I mean, this one, this is financial instruments for land development. It's not all kind of financial instruments. I mean, it looks good, but it's just one type of instrument. So in reality, the other types of financial instruments are really missing in the plans. And that's not at all positive because it means that we can, um, I mean, propose wishful lists a lot in the plan, but if we do not have capacities, institutions, and financial means to implement, then it's not going to work. Uh, well, I don't want to say much on this, but none of the plans has a stakeholder analysis or related to climate change or adaptation monitoring indicators. It has a lot of indicators, but not indicators on adaptation. Or even public information and policy influencing the policy related to climate change. So it's still like uh, an isolated issue. It's not yet felt like it is a society or societal issue. Of course, in all cases, there are best practices proposed. And um, in all cases, we have databases established, though the databases are, first of all, not so good always, weak in some of the very important elements. And what is the worst is that um, are not updated. So we have uh, built a data set now, and that is maybe going to remain like that for, for a while. To conclude, I mean, um, well, Besides the fact that Albania is a climate change high risk country, and that we know already, I would like to say that plants in Albania are sensitive to climate change and contain diverse measures about climate change. But this is really um, done mainly on the will of those who prepare the plan, more than on, based on, on a common methodology, uh, which is somehow defined, telling us that you should do this. And I'm not saying we, we should have a fixed methodology, because planning is dynamic, it shouldn't be um, rigid. But there should be some minimum requirements of things that we need to do, like for instance the vulnerability analysis. It has to be done. Or we have to think of adaptation models. I mean, we have to think of uncertainty. Um, not just make analysis for the sake of the analysis without understanding where it is leading us. Um, what is <coughs> else is missing is also the adaptation monitoring, financial measures and databases are established but not so strong. Therefore, the recommendations go straight from the conclusions. I mean, it's just another way of formulating them. What I would like to um, point here is, of course, these aspects which need to be addressed in our climate change related planning. Um, and the fact that municipalities and the government should start thinking of funds and budgetary measures. Otherwise, will not be able to implement. Of course, we, uh, I mean, this can be very expensive and maybe we don't have the money, but that's why we need planning in this case, to help us understand what is to be done first, how to prioritize with that little amount of money that maybe we do have at our disposal. And what are things that maybe do not cost so much but have a very good effect and we need to start implementing. Not everything is costly. I mean, there are measures or actions which just require a little bit of awareness, first of all, and then uh, even behavior. Behavior is one of those which is not costly, which has to start changing. And last but not least, municipalities can benefit from IPA3 now, and maybe in the future also from cohesion funds. Both funds have money for climate change related issues, which means that we need to improve our planning, we need to improve our capacities in our future to be able to absorb those funds and start making use of them. Thank you. like to invite our three speakers, uh, and of course, as well as Professor Paolo Pino. There is one here. Okay, so now the floor is to you guys.
break the ice. Of course, the question is for you. Now, I mean, uh, first one is a bit more provocative, uh, and the second one is a bit more with the system. The first one, you know, going to resilience, are we already anticipating that the worst scenario is happening? Because, you know, in a certain way, it could be also a sign of either giving up or uh, our subconscious, the society, is already telling that maybe we are failing and therefore we should start thinking how to, you know, prepare ourselves to be more agile or, you know, more, more flexible. And the second one is that, you know, we all, uh, for many years now, are talking about adapt adaptive planning, but uh, I don't know whether for good or for bad, planning is an instrument of the governance system. And while we want to be adaptive, usually our governance structures, or government, I should not even use the governance in this case, are fairly rigid. Command and control are used with the, you know, to work in a certain way. How this should be mirrored in a, you know, if we want adaptive planning, what kind of adaptive governments should we have in place? Yes, but I don't want to. Do I this or that? Or, uh... Okay. I think everybody can hear me, I suppose. Yes. Uh, thank you for breaking the ice. Uh, I, think, I think your second question was more provocative than the first one. Um, yes. Whether, if we talk about adaptation to climate change and resilience, does it mean that we've given up? Is the question, the way I use it. It isn't. You are right that sometimes that's the feeling that we get, that somehow you go to municipalities or talk to government, it seems that the discourse, the narrative has shifted and everybody is saying, we're not going to be able to do anything about climate change, so let's just try to survive. Um, and there is a huge danger there, because there is no adaptation which is as good as mitigation. So if we didn't do all the bad things that we did, we, did it, we went in this situation in the first place. But so I suppose we should still put the priority on mitigation, on trying to get that one and a half degree. Because to be honest, if, that, if they are right, and if we are going to go over the two degrees, none of these adaptation measures that we're talking about is going to help us. <coughs> so that's the first thing. I agree with you 100% that the international community should really put the emphasis on bringing down CO2 emissions. And that's the first point. But then within that, we do know that the previous, even, even if tomorrow we get to a point that we've reached the CO2 emission to a level that will guarantee the one and a half and nothing more than that, even if it happens just like that tomorrow, we are going to see the consequence of the last 40, 60 years of English. And for some people, it's going to be serious stuff. It could be Albania, but it certainly are the islands, the small islands that are actually going down. It could be the city of London, where all the financial institutions are. Because, you know, Thames Barrier uh, used to be closed God knows every so many years, and they are not closing it much more frequently. So, so it's not either or. We have to we'll do our utmost on mitigation, but we, at the same time, in parallel to that, we have to be prepared for some of the consequences. And that's the right way to talk about it. Of course, my talk, as I said right at the beginning, because of because of the long list that my colleagues gave me about what I need to talk, it was more on adaptation, and I was trying to link that to idea. But you're right in terms of mitigation is more important. In terms of um, the institution, again, I had one slide which said, we can only do these kind of ambitious things that we don't quite know how to do, but we have to experiment, adaptive planning, only if certain preconditions are in place. And the top one is to have agile institutional framework. If I work in an institution which is rigidly hierarchical, 
If I want to go from A and B, I have to fill five forms and obey with ten rules, some of them absolutely silly, then I am not going to be sort of spontaneously responding to issues. I will become a cog in the machine. <coughs> and it's no, there is, I mean, talk of the adaptation, adaptive planning is just nonsense in that situation. We have to change our institutional structures. I mean, to some extent, universities are a bit better. You, universities are flat organizations. So I do pretty much a lot of things that I want to do. You know, I don't have to ask permission all the time. Within the frame, of course, within the conduct of the institutional conduct and so on. But then you go to another institution and it's really hard to even the simplest thing and everybody just gives up and just say it's a waste of time. So you're right, you're right. And it's not just institutional framework. There are other things which I was trying to communicate. Reflexive planner. Again, how do we teach our planners to be reflexive? How do we, actually as individuals, how do we learn to think on our foot? Because that's the idea of a spontaneous reaction. We've got to be able to spontaneously respond to something that happens that we have no idea it's going to happen. And do the right thing at that moment. I mean, you, there's a huge amount of public management literature which is telling us. I mean, Donald Schoen was talking about reflexive practitioners. And a lot of it comes down to learning by doing. <laughs> Letting people do things, experiment, and learn, and develop that wisdom. It's not about expertise, it's not about science. It's about the thing that you collect over the years. It's like that violinist that plays without even thinking about me. And that's where, that's, yeah, and it's not just planners, it's generally speaking, a lot of actors. And it is all, all of these things are under the banner of capacity building that we, all three of us, been talking about. And, and inclusivity. You know, if we really take uncertainty seriously, and if we really don't know, and we know a lot of things. Can I just say that uncertainty has different levels? And I was talking about the extreme ones, the unknown unknown. There's lots of known unknown. There's lots of known, you know. And we can get those things at least right. Yeah. But I was sort of zooming on that. But if this is the case, we need everybody's brain and ingenuity to contribute to the knowledge. Knowledge is not exclusive to people who go to university. <coughs> okay, well, um, first of all, thanks very much for these three excellent presentations. Um, I, I just following um, some of you know this last question. Um, I'm concerned not so much uh, with the capacity of the institutions, you know, to change and become more agile, but actually also with the instruments themselves and the planning instruments in particular. You know, um, um, I'm quite concerned that um, in many planning systems um, we, we evolved from systems um, very much uh, based on, on a design and an engineering approach and now we are moving into uh, the legal aspects that are, you know, becoming more and more important in terms of planning. And uh, you know, this 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 prevalence of law and of lawyers that are invading this uh, our planning systems, you know, to me is is really a, a threat to any kind of adaptation strategies because. One thing that we know from war is that they are based on uncertainties. You know, it's always this idea of the rights of people, and in particular related with property. So now, uh, that's one point I like to make about adaptation. The other point about mitigation is that uh, how I see things is that uh, in the recent past. 
uh, the main problem was our production system. It was the production system that was generating a number of impacts, and, uh, and particularly environmental impacts. Now, actually, especially in this part of the world, it's not so much the production system, it's the consumption system. And when it comes to the consumption system, if you want to be effective in terms of mitigation, let's face the fact that you have to change the way we live. I mean, I'm sure most of you are aware that one of, of the greatest problems we have is about the diet we have. The diet we have is extremely intensive in resources because it's based on, on meat and on food, on, the, and the, on, on fish, sorry. And um, so um, we have to change this. We have to change, you know, our transport systems. All this idea of more efficient transport systems based on electricity and non-polluting things. Um, I mean, they represent a move, it's true, but it's a kind of a modest move. Because the problem is we have to organize our, our cities not so much in terms of the transport systems we have, but in terms of avoiding the use of those systems. That is, reducing the needs to go from A to B. So that is, instead of being based in terms of mobility, we have to shift the paradigm and think in terms of accessibility. We organize our cities from inside so that everyone can have most, most of things just nearby, and so we can walk or find. So this is a huge challenge, you know, and, and, uh, and uh, I know planners can do something about this, but uh, perhaps not that much. I don't know. I don't know. Just a question. Thank you very much for, for all the lectures. Uh, they were very interesting. I'm an ecologist. So, uh, I'd like to, to, to ask your opinion on how much the denial of some right uh, conservators about the climate change might affect adaptive planning. I do understand very, uh, very much the university and scientists and planners are very much into accepting and understanding the consequences, short term, long term. But at the very end, politics and, and, and governments would play a role. And, and now we do see that there is an increased number of denials and conservators against that. And probably it's an economic crisis also influencing it. So the first thing is how much the ad uh, adaptive planning is influenced by those controversial forces. The first thing. The second thing is how much is financial viable the adaptive planning as a new approach into planning versus the previous ones. Because at the very end, both at the local level more than the national level, but I would say at the national level, even global level, it comes to money. And an adaptive planning looks at the future I do understand if I talk to a politician talking about the consequences 30 years later might not be very much appealing to him, but if I say uh, for four years until the new elections might be really blinking a light into his mind. So this to me seems a short sight for politicians. How to address that from a financial viability point? I don't know if I was clear. Thank you very much. Well, I'm going to let my colleagues to answer some of the questions related to some of the issues that are adaptation and so on. But I just wanted to say that just there was a report done some years ago. And by the way, UK was one of the first countries which had a planning, a climate change act of parliament. So despite the fact that the government's trying to get away from it, but they can't because it's an act of parliament. So it's written in legislation, 2008. 
And as part of that, lots of other things happened, and there is a, an independent body that keeps monitoring how, how much we've achieved, how much progress we've made, and every year they come and make it quite a bit of noises and so on. But and around that time, there was a report done, it was called a Stern Review. It was an economic review of the costs of climate adaptation. I mean, he obviously was an expert, if you are an economist, did all the calculation, and came up with the idea that the cost of adaptation is more than the cost of mitigation. So if we do not do anything with our ways of life, then we end up paying more. And I was just looking at the news recently, 2015, we had a massive flood in the UK, and it cost something like 1.32 billion pounds, the damage of that flood. And it's part of its insurance money, of course, paid, paid to the householders. So, so there, is, there, there, there are ways of actually highlighting that certain things, and I think Rudina was just making reference to it in, in her talk, that there are things that we can do which will save us money in the future. But then it comes the uncertainty, and that's the issue with adaptation, is the extent to which we adapt. We can go for scenario one, scenario two, scenario three. And the danger is that we can either over-adapt and spend lots and lots of money build a massive flood defense wall somewhere, or we can under-adapt. And getting that right is not going to be easy, and nobody knows. We have some of the most sophisticated water management modeling that you can imagine, but they always come with that much range and then say, you take it to go for this or to go for that. And it's going to cost different amount. And it's not just money, it's the actual adaptation practice. Some of it is not very good for other environmental issues. Some of it people hate. You know, they bought a house to look into the river, and suddenly a wall comes here and block their views. So it's not an easy decision. And in fact, that is exactly when adaptive planning kicks in. Because it talks about how do we phase this out. And the, the work that was done on Thames Estuary is a, is a good work. It's, but it's very procedural. It's not substantive, I should say that. But at least in terms of procedures, it says, if we get that many sea level rise, we do this. And we keep constantly monitoring it. And we are going to be agile. Let's see whether they are. And if we see things are moving there, then we do another, we do it completely different policy. So this is the kind of well, <coughs> adjust your policies along the way. The fact that politicians are looking only to their noses is is out of my hand. I mean, it's, and it has a name, it's myopic policy. And myopic policy making is no good for anything. And what we need to do is not to put the you see, we have this thing called evidence-based policy. And I always challenge that. I said we should call it evidence-informed society. Because if you inform the society, the electorates, they will vote then for people who they think is going to carry the right policy. So rather than, be, you know, the shortcut is no good. Talking to politicians sometimes is not going to get us anywhere. Because some of them just don't vote. But talking to people, they have the power to change the politicians. And I think maybe some of us as academics, that's what we should be doing. Talk to people. On denial, all I, I don't know. But all I can say, it's not an innocent thing. Most of the, lo the, the anti-climate lobby is funded by millions and billions of petroleum dollars. It's, it's, it's very actively supported by that. There is a guy called Bill Rees who, is, uh, who made, he coined the board and gave the methodology of ecological footprinting. And he has a lot of stories to tell us about 
about climate denial and who is benefiting from that denial. Yeah. So, but I think you are more qualified to answer some of them. I just want to, to add something um, related, in relation to the fourth question, last question, and also to the presentation you did, when you described the resilience concept and you know, graphically also there was this question of reaching, there is a travel somehow and then there is a new status quo and then a balance, a new balance. Um, uh, I think that in the 70s we had a similar, relatively similar situation like now where at the end of this period, you know, you know, this, uh, you have this student movement, you have this uh, human rights movement, uh, we talk about environment also, anti-war movement, everything. This brought a, a different, uh, created a different climate and put pressure on politics, which changed. And which brought, as a matter of fact, after one or two decades in power, people like Bill Clinton. And when Bill Clinton comes, it's not a matter of one person, but it's a matter of mentality and the group of mentality of politics that came in somehow in power in the United States to introduce the Ministry of Environment. Uh, at the time, for, because of the scientists and universities also, in Eastern, the deputy uh, president also was coming from the circles, they will introduce also the instrument of environmental impact assessment, uh, which was relatively new. I, to political level, I, I'm talking. I'm not talking to scientific circles. So since then, there was a new equilibrium found. Up to the moment that, because of the, the, this model of governance, some new trouble came out. Maybe it was not about the environment. Maybe the environment was about that, but it was maybe about transparency, corruption, and other things. There was a turmoil. Now we are facing a trouble, and I'm sure that soon we will uh, struggle to find a new balance. But in this moment, uh, in power, it's a, a new type of politics. Populism is dominating. They are taking measures, actions, anti, uh, you know, climate uh, change, uh, uh, Kyoto Protocol, and you know, resigning, uh, yes, giving up yes, from uh, Paris Agreement and other. And I'm sure after some years, people will see that these results are not contributing for good, because then the water will come to home, so the cities will be flooded, so they will enforce a new balance. So. I'm sad in one sense, but I'm optimistic that the only way should come from people. Huh? Yeah. And it's learning by doing, as you said, but it's also learning from mistakes and from costs that you, you, you experience. So that is uh, one. Second, I uh, want to go a little bit down to the debate of case of Tirana. It was mentioned also, Regina mentioned also, the, some actions taken uh, to, to deal with climate change, which is true. But I'm thinking at the same time that uh, how uh, conscious these, these uh, measures are, are taken and what is the real impact. It's true that we have more pipelines and this is to be complemented with this administration, but we don't have public transport. And if we want to reduce the CO2 emissions, and if we don't want cars to travel one hour from here to Polis for five kilometers, one hour, the best is to, of course, to do the, the, the biking uh, thing because it promotes a new culture, but from the other side we have to promote Public transportation. I don't think that this country don't have this uh, experience. Experience is there, knowledge is there. We just need to push for this, and in order to, to create a new balance, and that is a trouble uh, for the moment. But I'm thinking with, uh, with some uh, change in uh, in the leadership, and uh, we will go to the to the need for the public transportation, better public transportation, which can uh, reduce a lot CO2 emission. It's not about bike, if you ask me. The bike is a cultural issue which is very positive, it's bringing people out of the car and, and uh, coping with, a short, with a certain distances. Yeah. Yeah. But then if you, if you think for the big polluter, then it's the, the private cars, Absolutely. which should use, instead of them, we should use more efficiently with Absolutely. less uh, polluting uh, cars. It's a relatively easy measure. It's exactly. relatively yes. easy. And it's tried and tested everywhere. And it's not the kind of the unknown oh, no, 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 or anything like that. You, it can be there. done, and the, the, the space is there, it can be done. I mean, we just had a very short tour of the city, and you could immediately see in some of the main axes, very easily, you can put a tram exactly. Exactly. It's as, as simple as, I mean, it is simple, honestly. It just needs a political will. It does need money. Of course, it, everything needs money, but uh, there are the other Money is there. It's just, I explained it's just a willingness. Uh, another point, it was the, the last uh, the, the plan of the city, municipal plan. 
and there was a lot of uh, there was this lobby of construction industry that was pushing for construction. There is this conservative uh, way of uh, politics in Albania of thinking that construction it's a good uh, sector to to make growth, economic growth for the country. This area, in fact, is over. If you ask me, uh, there are maybe other reasons behind this. I don't want to, to enter now on, on this, but it's a fact that they reintroduce the construction as the main economic growth, uh, let's say, sector for, for the city and for the country. Now, uh, in order to, to soften the effects, high density, pollution, loss of public space, etc., loss of green uh, air quality, uh, you know, damage, they introduce that the buildings will have in balconies more and more, you know, green thing. The tires will they have more green. And they introduce also the orbital, uh, the forest, as they call it. But when we did the survey, we have Professor Shane also with the, yeah, together for the. We understood that uh, this orbital forest instead was worsening the situation. Why? Because uh, the planners that did the plan, which are not planners by the way, but uh, yes. uh, and the politicians uh, decided to uh, that wanted to make a kind of populist approach uh, by giving people what they wanted, uh, they were concerned. But in fact, this curtain in periphery is just helping to reduce further the temperature uh, increase, yeah. Yeah. No, in the periphery and increase 5 to 6 degrees in the city center and also discharge all the pollution that are normally uh, yeah, uh, circulating and going to periphery in a normal circulation going back to the city center and being discharged in the city center in the past we have experiences they call it uh, stepping stones uh, you know, approach or as we call it Puga de Gel, the Gel Botana we had in communism, and they <laughs> they used it. And in in summer here in Tirana, you could feel still the breeze of the mountain eh? mm -hmm. and the, the fresh, uh, let's say, air that was coming. Of course, it was a smaller city, no no cars, different uh, context. I I understand it, but there were these kind of uh, green corridors penetrating the city and totally providing different quality of, of, of life. I think it's a matter again of balance uh, to, to to go to this. Uh, New balance and uh, this will produce new politics at the same time, hopefully. Good force uh, in new politics. If I could also add something. Uh, yeah. I mean, what can we do as planners? And, uh, well, planners like to work with certain issues, issues which are certain, and are working in an uncertain context, so trying to build probabilistic theories. Uh, to make the world predictable, and we still cannot make it predictable. But there is one thing which we can do, and that is uh, to produce knowledge and to uh, try to help people who have knowledge to exchange that knowledge. There is, there is a lot of knowledge at the community level. It's traditional, historical knowledge about, I don't know, how forests work, how pastures are used, I mean, about this issues that Bessin just already mentioned so on. And then there is also scientific knowledge which the expert, ex experts are producing. But there is no exchange between these two groups. I mean, this is what planners can do. They can help for this exchange to actually happen. And on this way, by strengthening communities, then we can, as you said, affect uh, uh, governments. And, and this is something which is happening everywhere. I mean, a few weeks ago, I was in this um, European Week of Regions, mm -hmm. and it happened that I was in, in a round table with 30 other participants. I was the only one from the Western Balkan. All the others were from member states from Western Europe. Um, so our issues in Albania are totally different from those in the Western Europe. And I felt, okay, I'm out of place here. What can I tell these guys? If I start complaining about corruptions and problems, they will not even understand me. But then on the way in the discussion, I understood that we share a lot of problems. Well, the cities there look much better than our cities, maybe. But and one of the problems we share is exactly uh, lack of knowledge and lack of knowledge transfer. So people need to understand that. I, I had an example there of the soil seeding. Mm -hmm. I mean, what does it mean soil seeding? How does it affect me as a person in my neighborhood? How do I know that if we have high soil seeding, then we do not have infiltration, and then when we have, because of climate change, heavier rains, we will have a lot of storm water and urban floods. 
which were every year, so twice or three times a year in Tirana. But people don't know that. Um, that kind of information is missing. So that's what I think we can do, is to help with knowledge. Mm -hmm. There's a lot that can be done. I would like to thank you, our three panelists. And I would like to thank you, the survivors of the lectures. Those of us, the real ones that believe in, in a different type of planet. <laughs> I personally enjoyed it, and I hope that also you, just by the fact that standing here, I've enjoyed it. It was a great pleasure to have Professor Sidi Nabudi here. It's a pleasure for me. Yeah. I would like to thank you. Thanks again. Thank